Blitz Digital Arts in South Africa. Um, I teach game design, um, in particular analog Analyst, games. I'm going to pause also... you for a second. We're having audio issues on this end, so pause for just a second. I couldn't handle your coolness, Karen. You broke the game. <laughs> I think it was the swap of, of Nero and Romeo. <laughs> or maybe the maybe the nearly trash talking Twitch. Maybe that's what it was. <laughs> Thank you for being our uh, test case. No worries. <laughs> All right. And you can just start. The audience hears us. Okay, cool. Um, okay, folks, in case you just missed our introduction there. Um, hello, welcome, first panel, which means, uh, yeah, we're the, we're the uh, guinea pigs. So do stand by in case there are any more issues like that. I'm sure they'll be really quickly sorted out. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what we do. Then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we've had um, and kind of ways forward. Ah, oh, and we have another cat on the channel. Brilliant. It just gets better. <laughs> so my name is Dr. Esther McCallum-Stewart from Staffordshire University. Um, and I'm a, an associate professor in game studies. And along with my colleague, Nia, who, Nia Wynn, who will introduce themselves in a moment, um, we teach a board games course. And my pronouns are she and her. And Kieran, you are next. Great. So, uh, thanks. Um, I'm Kieran, Kieran Reed. Um, I'm head of department at Bits Digital Arts, which is based in South Africa. Um, we run a full interactive program, digital program, um, with a core stream of game design in which I teach analog games and experimental narratives or literature. Um, and yeah, and you'll see my friend Leah from time to time pop her ears into the screen, potentially. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kirsten. Thank you so much. I am Kirsten Dupree. I'm a lecturer at Digital Arts at Wits University um, with my colleagues Kieran and Romeo. I teach into the analog game design course as well as interactive fiction literature media uh, funneling into Kieran's fourth year course. Uh, and that's me. I don't have a cat, unfortunately. I won't hold it against you, it's okay. <laughs> uh, Nia? Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Nia Wern. I am the course director for eSports, Game Studies and Communities, which is still the longest job title I've ever had. But I've been lecturing in games design for 15 years, um, in which I've taught sort of employability, but also narratology, um, and specifically pulled together a stream of experimental and analog um, gameplay modules within a sort of a much larger program um, at Stafford University where the student body in games take up uh, it's about a fifth of the universities is the largest department by any means we have thousands of students studying um, courses but I've pioneered a sort of specifically an analog board game module that's been a core element of the computer gameplay design and production and the game studies course for a number of years. Um, I also don't have a cat. I do have a child, but he's watching television, so he won't be a problem. <laughs> you say that now. <laughs> okay, and Romeo, go for it. Oh, um, I'm Romeo Molongwana. Um, I am a co-lecturer uh, for the Analog Game Design uh, class, along with Kirsten. Um, I'm currently uh, doing my master's um, on the evocative nature of video games. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a fairly new territory for me. Um, I've been here for about, I suppose, three, four years. Uh, I also don't have a cat. I have a dog who likes to pretend she's a cat, but yeah. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like we're doing well. We're a menagerie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, Let's start by just talking a little bit about what it is that we actually teach, because I think giving a bit of a grounding of that, you know, having a course that seems to perhaps have less games that you're teaching games within, and a course that is or courses that are very centred around games, it's really interesting. You've got two quite different focuses there, and I think they bring really different things. Um, so, Nia, do you want to just yeah. describe gameplay applications? Um, yeah. and then we'll move, over, move over to the others. 
Yeah, so gameplay applications is a, a module, which is what we would call, and most people would call a course. It's part of a bigger program of study. Um, it runs over both semesters, so um, September or October to April, typically. Um, it's gone through so many iterations, initially conceived as a sort of games jam for credit, and in fact then gravitated to be physical games and look at gameplay as a whole, and then kind of settled on being a long game, analog gameplay solo project. And that's a, the solo bit is really important because one of the things we noticed, we do loads of group work, we've got loads of teams, we've got teams at the moment making games, but we actually found that there wasn't anywhere where students had said, we've started a project, I've started and I've finished a project and I've done everything. So we kind of conceived this thing that stepped away from using game engines. Almost all of the rest of the teaching we do is either making game engines, using game engines, or putting things into a game engine. And what I got, what I noticed was we started to have students that made very similar games because they were just going by what the game engine could do. And what we wanted to do instead was actually see what the students were capable of designing if they weren't held by the game engine in some way. Um, so we've kind of always pitched it as, this is your chance as a designer to say, I can make this, and my the only thing that held me back was cardboard. Um, and also there's a load of project stuff and a load of production skills things that come in with that. So now, yeah, in, so up until this last year, it's been this sort of really long project in in making a game. We changed the theme every year. We took them to a museum one year. We've used the Dewey Decimal System to inspire them in the last couple of years. We told them to, it could be about science, but it had to be fun at least once. Um, we're not looking for educational games. We're not looking for... Uh, games to teach anything because we find they get really hung up on like specifics of oh I'm going to make a game that teaches people a certain language and like no we just want something fun we want to really push play but also um, play testing as well and get that whole iterative design thing down so there's a lot in amongst this one module about games um, about making board games that the students don't necessarily realize so that's us at staffs so how does that compare to the to everyone else's <laughs> module. Yeah, she did my job for me. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, you, a lot of the things that you're mentioning there, I, I picked up as sort of keywords that we're really interested in. Um, it, so ours was originally, it was the first sort of game design program in Africa, and it's, it's particularly geared towards making designers as opposed to kind of developers. But what we did was we work with students from engineering and students from the School of Arts. So we have a cross-discipline kind of curriculum that's that's moving forward in those two directions. And since the inception, we've really thought, as you were mentioning, it's not, it's not about the game engine and it's not about the kind of graphics and it's not about these kinds of things. We actually want design thinking. Um, and, and our motive and way of working has always been paper, pen, cardboard is the way that you can actually think through your design, you know, because a board game can't hide its rules. It's really easy when you're playing a role-playing game, a digital role-playing game. The dice are being rolled, but you don't see it. So, so we really want our students to actually actively think through those processes and think through, oh, how do I get my player to be excited about that? Or how do I get them to engage with that or think it through in some way, shape, or form? So, so very much a, a, the same sort of thing in terms of this is design thinking first and foremost, and in particular, designing play experiences, designing fun things, and working there. Um, it's a full year-long course, ours, and it, it, you have to do it to go to Game Design 2, where you learn to code, and then in Game Design 3, you kind of mix the two together. So you've got the design thinking and the kind of coding together. And very much iterative process through and through, that's really what we want. And we want to also kind of teach and highlight playtesting as, as a huge aspect of what they're doing. But for some reason, they're terrified of playtesting the students. Um, it's, it's, not their, it's not always their strong suit, um, even though we say in almost every lecture, have you playtested your game? But um, it, it does vary when, when they do or don't playtest. Um, so yeah, that's our course. I don't know if um, colleagues want to add anything, but I think as a general overview, yeah, that's that's the course. Uh, yeah. I'll just add that I'm thrilled to hear playtesting and iterating. 
coming from another department because our students don't always believe us when we tell them how fundamental those two processes are to game design. So um, it's quite validating for me to hear that. Uh, and I may um, download this and upload it as a lecture for next week. <laughs> it's, I mean, the similarities are amazing. And yeah, for us as well, it's exactly the same thing. Students don't seem to believe us that we've like, this is how games are made. Yeah, I'm just going to make it. Like, no, but it needs testing. What do you think testers do? Uh, I don't know. I think it's really interesting that you're teaching um, analog before you move on to the sort of coding because we have this, the students, our students tend to come from the other, the other end. So they've already done um, bits of, bits of kind of uh, using coding, using um, development and production, but so they're kind of used to doing it online, but they're not used to doing it physically. Um, and I think it's really kind of fascinating that they wouldn't produce a game, you know, online. <laughs> <laughs> and then give it to the give it to the adoring public like that has mm. to go through constant play testing and yet this this seems to be such a kind of sticking point um and rules is the other one i think we can kind of go on to rules but romeo you were a student and now you're a lecturer kind of what what's your take on the play testing because you must have actually gone through that how did you how did you actually find that that affected you when you were actually a student and then how do you feel about it now as a lecturer <laughs> Um, I, I must say, I, I don't speak for everyone um, who was in my class, uh, but we very much saw it as a, it's a thing we got to do to get marks. Um, it wasn't so much as, okay, it's going to help towards the development and design of our games. It was for a matter of, hey, they say we should do this, so how about we do this just so we don't lose out on marks? Um, and that's sort of the approach that we had, but um, I, or rather that we had in the beginning of our first year. Uh, but further on, I'd say in the second or third quarter, second semester around, um, we started to realize uh, that, uh, obviously, because our marks came out to be really crap, but um, we came to realize at the end that this thing that we are doing, especially that we're doing with people who are in the same context as us, who have the same exposure to the same games that we do, um, they really helped push along the development cycle of our game. They helped realize what we might have missed. Um, and so we, we stopped looking at it just as a, hey, let's all just play this game because our game is fun and it's cool. And it started to become a thing of, let's, how, how about we start keeping record of what you say? Let's keep record of how you're playing. Let's keep record of the different actions that, you, that you're doing. That way we can actually start to track and create, I suppose, a graph of sorts um, that, that follows what, how, what's sort of the optimal way to play our game. What is the optimal strategy that people are employing? And there started to be sort of this, I want to say nuanced understanding of, of really why we're doing all of this instead of, hey, it's just for marks. Um, but moving out of the space of, you know, from student to lecturer, I think uh, I, it, it's odd being on the other side just because um, while we had the idea of it's just for marks, there's almost a, uh, I want to say, latency to picking up the ideas of, of play testing. I mean, people or most of our students would think that um, you know, if I give it to my mother and we play together and we have fun, then that's all it is. Um, and that's sort of the, you know, the, the, the ceiling that it's going to reach. Um, when, uh, when normally you start to see that again throughout the semester, that there are more students who, uh, who start to realize that, hey, you know, playing with my lecturers, playing with people in, um, in my household really helps to develop this thing into what I want it to be. Um, and sort of ha getting them to really, or pushing them towards them realizing for themselves instead of telling them what it's for, um, is sort of the the approach that yeah that we started that have that we started to take there. I think so, there's something you said right at the start of that that reminds me. So we change the assignment every year roughly in how we've marked things. The year we didn't grade prototypes, no one made one, mm. even though. They needed to make a prototype in order to make the, the final finished game. They all they just went, oh, it wasn't graded, so we didn't think it was important. Like, okay. And they actually were like, yeah, everything that we need to hand, you want us to hand in, you basically, we're going to have to grade it or we won't. It will mm. drop down in our list of priorities. Mm. And that was just really like, and we tried, and we've done it for a really nice reason. We didn't want them to have to stress over Christmas. We wanted them to have a break. 
and they they just they didn't do it. And then their games all suffered at the end, and they were like, "Well, you should have you should have given us more work and graded the prototypes." Like, yes, <laughs> in future we will. Sure, but yeah. <laughs> Wonder whether where students and how students assign value to different things in game development is fascinating, yeah, and it's completely yeah. different from any other conversation you see with game designers of any kind. Where students see the value is like, oh well, I have to do this, this because this is the bits that degrades. Yeah, I was just reminded yeah. of that quite. Exactly. Listen, Romeo, you are the, you you also touched on one of the other bugbears that we have, which is parents. Um, and I don't know what the other two of you think about this as well, but we quite often find you wouldn't you wouldn't write Last of Us Two and play mm. test it with your parents, mm. and yet very often we find that it it can be a real a real demotivator, particularly because we have the festive break over December in the, in the middle of where they've probably just got their first prototype together, and they're all excited and they take it off, um, you know, and go home or are already at home as the case was this year and uh, show it to their parents and their parents do two things the first thing is they say oh that's great I don't really understand it but it's great so they're they're unfailingly positive without actually having any good feedback but we've also found that the other one is that parents also will also say oh what you're doing is ever so complicated mm. and so that's also you know, we have we have students who are developing these wonderful, you know, worker placement games or they're kind of thinking, you know, they've got some sort of uh, deception games. We've had a couple of really good ones and their parents just don't really understand it. So whilst they're very, very positive, the students will often come back and say, well, they didn't really understand it. But then we kind of say to them, that's not really the target audience, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, kind of um, feeding back to you, Kieran and, and Kirsten, have you got kind of any sort of input on this as well? So, Disembodied voice jumping in. Uh, Kieran, there's a question from the audience about what the difference between um, designer versus developer. Okay, great. Um, um... So yeah, so in our mind, the you know because we're focusing on the designing the play elements um, and how people interact and engage with a particular game, I think that would be our focus on what a uh, on what a designer is. So so what are the mechanics? How do the mechanics work? Um, how do people engage in various different ways um, and think through sorry and think through play and all of that kind of stuff. Um, versus the developer, which you know, in in terms of the at least in the coding courses, is very much coding it to the back end, developing it, kind of taking it further, making sure that the mechanics do work, making sure that when you jump and hit into an object, it actually does jump and hit into an object. So so we have shifted around into that sort of kind of thinking. Though I do understand in board games, a developer is something different from in digital games. So, so I, we don't do kind of development in a board game sense of someone takes over and does the play testing and works through it in that way. We, we're talking more about the kind of coding and, and assembling the, the piece um, together. I hope that answers the yeah, we see that. Yeah, we see that in exactly the same way. It's exactly how we see the difference between designer and developer. And we're really focused on sort of the de the designer as opposed to the sort of the back end developer or anything um but yeah so it's really nice to hear that sort of definition thing from another bit but yeah esther you forgot one other type of thing that parents do which is join in on the development so quite often yes. this because it's a physical element and a physical assignment this is the first time that they've been able to like help with homework so we have before now had parents help make figures a help with painting, help with, like actual board construction. Did um, we have because I remember pieces one year? Didn't somebody craft yeah. something? Yeah, like they made yeah, these they, little they, meeples. Yeah, I've <laughs> crafted um, player characters, and I had because we used to have a, a virtual, we used to have an actual board game expo, and my parents turned up to it. And I remember one of them going, "Oh, it's the first time I've helped with this homework since high school. It was amazing." And it was because it was a tangible thing that they they actually sort of helped and they wanted to help. And that was a really nice thing. First time I've understood what he's done in his course, all these kind of things. So there's a yeah, that third section of overly helpful parents is, 
is quite an interesting one too. Yes, it's not a very unexpected sort of element. So, yeah, okay. So let's uh, let's kind of back cycle. Um, do do ask more questions in the chat though, if you do have questions. And I think you know again. Oh, I have a whole bunch. Would you like me oh to do a couple? I want to make sure Kirsten uh, is able to speak because I kind of went to Kirsten and then we and then we sort of moved on. So let's just check in with Kirsten and then Perfect. let's go for, let's let's go for questions. I think like I think there's a lot to say. So. Absolutely. Um, what I wanted to say uh, in terms of kind of being an educator, teacher, whatever you want to call it, it, it can be very frustrating uh, that the students, you know, don't totally believe us when we tell them how important playtesting it is. But at the same time, I feel that it's important that we are generous um, and understanding of the difficulty of playtesting, which is essentially signing up for failure um that's what it is you're, you're sitting there and you're experiencing failure and that's a really difficult thing to do and for our first year course um so we start uh this year it was later because of COVID, but typically we start at the beginning of feb and run to the end of november and so at this point in our course our students are are relatively new and fresh in their kind of game design journeys and that's a really difficult thing to ask students to do, to volunteer to fail, to do so repeatedly, to do so publicly, and then talk about it and reflect on it. So it is, it is deeply frustrating, and I wish that we were able to um, maybe more effectively convey the importance, but I do understand the reluctance to participate in that process in the way that we would necessarily like them to. That's a really, really good point, actually. I've, I've written that down, actually. I think signing up for failure is a really, it's a, it's a strong line, but actually you're right, you know. Um, one of the things that we've tried to do is we've tried to actually make it part of the class. Mm. So the second semester is set aside and nominally, we do teach as well, but we have we have sessions that are specifically for feedback. Um, we also use the Playtest UK's um uh, playtesting forms so they which are open access and available online um, and again I'm sure we can find find the link for those because they you can just download them as pdfs and that gives them something that they can at least use a kind of tick box for um, but one of the other one of the other things that we've done which we find is both successful and hated um, and again is we make them swap rules so we do it. We do a couple of sessions about rule writing, where we take them through, you know, the sort of semantics. I do a really terrible presentation where I use the word "turn" about nine hundred times and talk about, you know, what does a turn mean? And if this is just one word, then, you know, think about all the words that you're using. And then we do one that's very much about teaching how to write rules and the sort of order. And we break down, um, "Hey, that's my fish," which has got something like three hundred words in the rules. So you can go through the whole thing in a lecture, but it's really, really clear, carefully done and it's got great illustrations. But then we make them sight unseen, swap rules with each other. So they're not given the game. They're just given the rules as written down and they have to then go through them. And they also, because usually, even if, even if they weren't physically in the classroom together, they'd be on teams together in in very small groups would then have to talk to each other about the bits that they didn't understand and you know we'd get them to sort of work through it and we found that that was really really useful and it goes from really fundamental things both Nia and I have have our personal hang-ups roll a dice is my favorite personal hang-up how big is your dice how many sides has it got because rolling a d6 a six-sided dice is very different from rolling a 20-sided dice. You, your game has completely changed immediately. And and so kind of doing this rule swap with them, we found was really, really did help them kind of firstly start to approach ways of talking to each other. Because as I say, they're face-to-face -face and they we, we couch it very much as a sort of help each other with, you know, this isn't about spelling properly. This isn't about writing properly. This is about clarity. Um but it, they really don't like that session, you know, and they often, again, we have to do quite a positive teaching session afterwards because they'll be kind of very, oh, my rules are terrible. And they're like, well, 
they're not good now, but they'll be better. You know, <laughs> you'll, you, you'll, you're definitely going to improve. You know? <laughs> I'm a big fan of a whimsical starting, like whimsical starting thing of who picks goes first. That's my, my big one is always like, make it fun, make it so it's an icebreaker and the students hate it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've had some good ones yeah. there. Go on, Kirsty, what are you going to say? Um, Jeff Engelstein's latest book on um, publishing and producing a board game has a really excellent chapter on writing rules, um, which you may find useful. Yeah. If you were. I'm looking for resources. It's really, it's really great. Um, the best kind of written explanation um, that we've managed to find. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Because if you don't understand the rules, you're not going to come back and play the game. Yeah. yeah. Um. Sorry, I just want to add a little bit. Um. I, I like that idea of swapping uh rules. It's something we had adopted um in 2019 and 2020. We did a a bit of a very sorry. I'm talking a little too quickly. Um. We did a little bit of a variation um uh, on it in 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 2020 during the the lockdown. Um. And we found that. What's interesting with, with that, I mean, yes, it, it, it bridges the gap between, you know, uh, the physical distance and we get to know each other quite a bit, uh, but I should probably explain what we did. So for um, one of the, um, I think it was for one of the assignments, um, they, every week they had to, um, uh, the students had to pull in or write uh, either reflection, a reflective piece or a draft of their rules um, or, or just write some information regarding your uh, about your game that you'd like some feedback on and we put them in groups um, and each person would give the next person feedback and so forth and so forth until everyone got feedback from everyone uh, in the in the group and then at the, at the end of the week um, you'll collect all, all the feedback that you received go through it and then respond to what um, uh, to what uh, feedback was was provided to you and uh, we found that that uh, sort of that activity um, allowed them to also crit start to critically think about how people are receiving their games. Besides the rules being well, to, uh, being nicely written or good to read and easy to follow, it was also about what is my game really trying to do? What, um, how are other people receiving what my game is trying to do? Um, and so they started to look at it and analyze it from a, an objective perspective, where it's no longer, oh no, they're killing my puppies, but now it's okay, cool. Now I'm I'm seeing what. Uh, what I've produced and how it's being received. Um, and we found that uh, going through that process, even into their, um, their exams, um, really started to I increase the, the, the quality of the kind of, or, or rather the quality of how they approach their games, not necessarily the quality of the games themselves, um, but how they were able to reflect on their design process, not just the game itself, but reflect on how they went about writing their game. I think there was a nice one-to-one uh, -one relation there yeah i think and i think you're right romeo we've also we also try and really make sure that we're teaching students about kind of the ecosphere of board gaming as well so we make and i think that idea of reception like yeah it's not just the rules it's how the rules what the rules where the rules yeah. and you know um we get them to produce a sell sheet in this kind of you know if you're going to go take your game out and sell it then you know what are you you know, what, what do you say on that that you don't put mm. on the box? Um, mm -hmm. You know, how do you catch people's attention? Um, yeah, so I think I think that idea of kind of production and reception really kind of comes in yeah. as well. So, hmm. Ooh, so many, oh, just writing notes that you probably see me. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we take some questions? Yep, I'm here with one now. Um, oh, yeah. Melissa in AU says, I'd love oh, to hear hey, how... <laughs> Uh, I'd love to hear how COVID has affected this physical design process, both in a practical way and also in terms of the types of designs students are making. Nia, do you want to take that from us? Because we had a really specific Yeah, question. I, I will. And then let's move over to the others. So, obviously, yeah. Um, so, we, we realized one thing very quickly. So, for us, I suppose COVID, COVID obviously happened last March which was just before, not last March, March before, which was just before they were handing in their board games they developed for the whole year. 
and that sudden flick to online we transplant to go online like within a week that suddenly meant they couldn't hand in physical games we had to rely on photos we had to like they had play tested but it all already been a bit like i'm not sure i want to play test i'm not here i've heard these things um and that became really interesting so it affected the the hand in of the year before quite and like the games themselves were kind of as made as they were going to be made but we suddenly had students self-isolating and couldn't get paper and couldn't go out and couldn't get resources in the, and they couldn't come into university to print. So that affected things. And then we realized when we had all these photos in and we asked for what would be inside the box and how would the components be, we actually didn't necessarily need the physical games handed in to be able to grade what it was going to be like. We already had the cell sheet. We already had um, rules. We already had, uh, like, there's a self-assessment part. So actually the physical game had been nice it wasn't necess necessary so when we came to planning this year which we knew was going to be entirely online um we did two things one we actually curtailed the amount of time to make the game because we weren't sure if we'd be back in in january or not so we designed the first semester to be entirely not, not entirely theoretical but wrong but industry focused we got them to do a lot more research and other things came out through this but we weren't sure at the time whether we'd be back back on campus in January because it'd all be over or not. We had to have a like a contingency plan. And our contingency plan was it's going to be 12 weeks of development. It's going to be only maximum two-player game because that helped a lot with um, playtesting because we figured they could probably find one other person to playtest with. And also, we did this whole thing about, look, two-player games are selling out. Everyone's been stuck in a house forever. Um, and that was a really big thing that we kind of changed because previously they'd designed games for five or six people or whatever. So two-player game, we set up a kind of fake publisher, Badger in a Box. If you named Badger in a Box. One thing yeah. we were really clear that we didn't want to do is that we didn't want to, we still wanted the physical maker part of it as much as possible, even though we knew that people would have lost resources. So we couldn't assume that they had access to technology, which kind of made us question some of the stuff that we'd assumed about privilege as well, which was kind of really useful for us. Um, but also we didn't want to say, oh, go off to Tabletop Simulator. Uh, we wanted to keep that, the, the sort of think about, think about the physicality of this. But yeah, sorry, Neil, and then we'll go on to the others. Yeah, so. and that was so although we have game design students and it's always assumed that they are the most tech savvy and all this kind of thing, actually they rely very heavily on our labs in at the university. We've got phenomenal game gaming labs and, and computer labs and loads of resources. And in fact, when they were at home, they didn't necessarily have those. We didn't want to turn into a, this would be actually be learning new software and didn't really want to swap wholesale to tabletop simulator. We left that if the student wanted to, and I don't think any of them, one of them did, maybe. Um, but what we wanted to do instead was, yeah, get them to think creatively about what they might have in the house, how they could represent pieces, but actually still go through the process of design. And if they were only designing for a maximum of two people, then that actually meant there was someone they could play to. So I don't think anyone lived alone alone. Um, and that we also <laughs> kind of jokingly asked whether we, they could make it so it's small enough to fit through a letterbox, which one of them did number them did but one of them definitely measured letterboxes but we just got them to refocus and rethink about what kind of games people were playing what kind of games they could make with what was around them and yeah really still keep that physicality of the game and how that would play and that again was a sort of those and also keeping a much smaller development time meant that it didn't sort of drag on for ages which otherwise would have been filled with playtest sessions and rule swapping and um, you know, playtest sessions went on for six or seven weeks because of sort of the size of the classes. So, yeah, that helped a lot in focusing what, what, and how we changed for um, the last twelve months. And I suspect in September, I think we'll be back on campus, so we'll have to change it again. And what we'll keep, I think, is something we'll keep at the end. We have also, or are just about to publish the syllabus because there is a book about game design syllabus is syllabi syllables. Um, and we actually submitted this as one of the chapters. So, Melissa, you'll be able to, to, to just mail me and I'll 
send it to you but <laughs> but we're, we're kind of happy to share it and it will be shared and it's going to be an open access publication for uh for everybody else who's not melissa so <laughs> um yeah over to you over to you folk yeah how did you deal with it um so i think i think um romy and i will both agree on this that we can hand this section over to kirsten because when when the pandemic hits i've never seen someone so frantically and also so magnificently restructure a course rethink it through and and care so deeply about our students because you know you're talking about um the lack of kind of technology and all of those kinds of things and a lot of our students live in very very rural and very kind of poverty stricken areas where even if they had a cell phone the cell phone signal doesn't reach there and, and you know there's so many kinds of things there and i and, and i think that the effort that kirsten kind of led and then romeo and i just followed along um, was really incredible in the kind of shifting to pandemic teaching. So I'm sorry for making you blush, Kirsten, but um, maybe you can give us an this answer. Um, yeah, I want to die, but thank you for those kind words. Um, yeah, so our experience um, moving online um, was interesting in that we were at almost the beginning of our curriculum. Uh, our students had been on campus for six weeks, um, and these are first-year students, so they'd only ever been at university for six weeks uh, when suddenly we shut down. Um, similarly, I think we had two weeks um, to get online because we were just about to have the midterm break, um, which was helpful. Um, and so there was, in the beginning, um, there was not a lot of game design. Um, and a lot of just how can we all kind of support each other, figuring out um, the different levels of access, um, who has what. We have quite a number of students um, who live by themselves because they come from rural areas um, across the country and they stay in residences in Johannesburg. Um, and so we're living by themselves for quite a number of months. Um, so even for them, playtesting for a number of them was really difficult because it was just them and uh, the residences were quite strict. They weren't allowed out of their rooms. Groceries were delivered. It was quite intense for a lot of our students. Um, so we moved to um, our curriculum towards a lot more kind of um, reflective and objective-based practice. Um, so, for example, one of the assignments was to design an abstract strategy game, um, which is relatively easy because all you need is some sort of token, um, and you could use beans or whatever, um, and a piece of paper to make some kind of a grid kind of thing. Um, so, component-wise, very light, very accessible. Um, but the brief uh, wasn't focused on the quality of the game. Um, it was rather focused on the objectives that they had set for themselves and whether or not they achieved those. Um, we tried as much as possible to encourage objectives that were uh, embedded in the experience that they wanted to create. So I want to create a game that can be taught and learned in under a minute, plays under 10, um, and feels really cutthroat for example. Um, and so we marked according to the objectives that they had set for themselves versus this game is broken, um, this part doesn't work, this is boring, uninteresting, whatever. Um, and from there, we saw a lot of really interesting things come out. We hadn't taught the students um, about team-based games or cooperative games yet, and yet we saw some of those. There was a lot of really interesting ideas that came out um, when all they really had was their kind of creativity and loneliness, um, to be frank. And um, since then, um, we've also added role and rights to our curriculum because a role and rights we're able to play as a class together. So I kind of prepare the slides, I roll the dice, I take the pictures. Um, put them up on the screen, um, and the students can either print or draw off the board for themselves. And then we all hop onto a call, um, and it's recorded and uploaded um, in a data light uh, way. 
Um, so he was unable to join KK afterwards. Um, and all 120 of us, depending on who wakes up at 8 o'clock on a Monday morning, um, can play this game together. And we can talk about it and have a shared frame of reference because one of the things that we have lost is the ability to play games with our students. So we have a great library on campus that the students don't have access to. And so replicating um, playing and learning by playing has also been a challenge. And role and rights have been really helpful for us because uh, you know there's interesting ideas there with regard uh, with regards to kind of managing and mitigating randomness, um, strategic decisions, all those kinds of things. So um, yeah, it's it's been interesting. Hopefully the students feel okay. I'll also add that very helpfully for me last year, one of our first year students was my sister. And I moved back into the house to help my parents with childcare. And so one of our students was about 10 meters away from me. And I could get a pretty clear sense of how the students were doing. So thank you, Michaela, um, for, for that. So that was us last year and still currently, unfortunately. Yeah. And if, if I can just add, I think, I think what's been really great, I mean, obviously, COVID hasn't been great. But what has been really great is that our students' ability to reflect and to write critically about their work is is much better than it ever was. Um, mm. And and you know we've learned a lot of kind of teaching practices that we can now implement even when we go back. And and I'm quite yeah. excited for that to be back in the classroom, but with some of the thing you know we have a they do a design journal. They have to write in each week about every game they play, every decision they make, all of those kinds of things. And they, they're just able to talk about it much better. Um, and, and that's been a really great thing about COVID. I hope that answers the question we have. <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I think I, Nia and I have talked about this a lot as well. One of the things that we discovered, which in retrospect seems to make perfect sense, but only really clicked when we started to teach online is that people communicate in different ways we, we know that and we hadn't it hadn't gone through our system so we saw students who not a peep in class who were suddenly most active on chats or they're mailing each other a lot or they're communicating online and then the ones who would always speak up in class are speaking up still um but that yeah, the, the self-reflection, yeah, I think we could absolutely completely agree on that as well. So, yeah. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left. So, uh, Avi, have we got any more questions? We absolutely do. The next one is, uh, I'd love to know if playing board games has affected the way you teach, uh, uh, the way you teach how to make board games, and was there a specific game that influenced your teaching? Um, yes, <laughs> because again, I think you have to do in order to, um, you know, in, in order to be able to teach things effectively. One of the things that we discovered, and we discovered this quite early on in the teaching, is that um, a lot of our students were very knowledgeable about video games, but they had virtually no knowledge of board games. So they would say things like, we, we actually get them to do a reflection in the first week where they talk about the games that they've played, and a very common sentiment would be I've played all of the board games I've played Scrabble and I play Monopoly at Christmas um so we actually as you see Romeo is just like oh dear <laughs> so but what we actually had to start doing was teaching teaching them to understand how to play board games that and we we did three concrete sessions what we now call party games gateway games and sort of more complicated games and that's those sessions have changed names but I think for me, it was Hey, That's My Fish, which is an incredibly simple little box game. I should have brought it upstairs with me. Um, Badger, if you could go and get it, that would be great. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, 350 words in the in the rules, very clearly written. Um, we had to change it a little bit because all the pronouns are he um, throughout, so it doesn't actually make that much sense when you're reading it out. Um, but that, 
it kind of makes the point that a simple game isn't actually all that simple to design and write. That there's a lot of thought behind it. So we, yeah, we did let's plays as well. The first time yeah. ever, I did a let's play of a game, and I drafted it in my six-year-old because um, why wouldn't you? <laughs> um, to show also to showcase that games are sort of universal. But we played Go Nuts for Donuts, which I had for Christmas. But we actually do, a, and so yes, yeah, so there's a video somewhere of me and my son playing it in which he won. He's six people. Um, and that was a really great thing to go like, it's, these are not, when you, lots of them went, oh, I, I want to make family games. And I'm like, well, what do you mean my family game? What do you sort of pull across? And we did a lot of, like, of, there's a pile of games behind me and Esther has a whole bookshelf of games. We did a lot of like pulling games to the camera to show them that we owned them. And that was a really important thing for us to demonstrate that, like these are games that we're not just talking about abstractly, but these are games we play. We talked about games that we play. We talked about games we played at Christmas. We talked about, I used to run, I run a board game club in a local city or used to when people got together and played board games. Um, and so I talked about how different people played games and really telegraphed the kind of examples we had where we couldn't, as we usually would have done, opened up our board game library, got them everyone playing whatever we had in there. Um, but yeah, we really also, showcasing these different kind of games. We had a slight issue with the board games library because we've also got quite a large board games library, which was that when the first lockdown happened, all the staff from the department ran in and took all the games out. <laughs> So we didn't, we, we knew that they, we've got a little list that says where they will go, but suddenly the board game library looked a lot smaller and there's a good hundred games in there. Because <laughs> the staff had very sort of cannily rushed in and thought, yeah, I'll, I'll grab a couple of those. <laughs> so how about, how about you folk? Um, if I could chime in, if that's all right. Um, so I, I, my, uh, I suppose context was a little bit different. As I said, I've only been teaching for like three, four years, Matt. Um, and uh, I came from, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm black, and in the context of where I lived, um, I used to live in the free state where board games was was never heard of. It was it, it was a thing we didn't know of. Snakes and Ladders was as far as we knew. Uh, from the free state, I was in Limpopo. Limpopo, we played um, hopscotch or skipping, and there was, again, board games wasn't a thing. Um, it was only once we moved here where um, my first exposure to board games was in things like Ludo, uh, also snakes and ladders and and sort of the very basic kind of board games but i think what um what because uh, what brought me into the sphere of wanting to teach um board games was for me settlers of Catan, um which Kirit introduced me to in my first year um and we had a, a, a sort of a tournament of sorts uh, where we would come through every break uh, play settlers of Catan, and just before class with Kieran walking be like this color one and be like no but all my work um, <laughs> and um, and I think what uh, why, why that game specifically is, is firstly it was my first real board game. I mean, I had heard of Scrabble, I had heard of Thirty Seconds, but none of them had the same sort of strategic planning as well as um, sort of play. If I could put it that way, me and you, we come together, we play this thing um, as uh, as as settlers of Catan. Um, and was again my my the first game that I had that really pushed that idea of what a game is for me as well. Um, I slowly understood it again from okay, cool, we roll dice, we play, or or uh, um or also uh, in high in high school in my matric year, uh, we knew very much about Dungeons and Dragons and role playing games, and that's as far as we knew. But an actual uh, sort of a system that facilitates mechanics, that facilitates a certain way of playing. That was uh, sort of a new idea to me. And Settlers of Catan was, um, well, at the time, was the game that really pushed it um, forward for me. And then the second was Dominion. Um, but yeah, it all started very much at Settlers. Yeah, we do, we've got a couple of sets of Dominion and they're always, yeah. always really influential. Yeah. Carcassonne yeah. is, yeah. is always yeah. the one that, that's the one that really started off everything for me. It was and it, but that was the game I was introduced to it at a conference, and I was like, "This is amazing!" And then suddenly I had every carcass on add-on ever. And then that's what I was sort of talking to the students about was like, "This is a game, but it's not a. It's I know it's I know we said board game, but it's not a board, and it's got dice and it's got these things mm. we call them meeples. Mm. This is amazing. Mm. Um, and there's this add-on, and it will change the way the game plays. And people would in. Look, here is a river, and here is DLC. There is DLC for this." with hexagons and like that I thought was a really interesting kind of 
way of getting the students to think about different kind of games. Um, Forbidden Islands, another one that comes up a lot of sort of gateway sort of collaborative games, especially. And I think a lot of students particularly like Forbidden Islands. I think it's got proper figures to move around. And we've seen that influence a lot of games that have sort of come out since from our students. If I can just add, yeah. Uh, should, should I go? Okay, I'll yeah. go. Um, Sorry, I and I was like pointed at you, Kirsten. <laughs> Not helpful. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I assumed it was me, and I took it and ran with it. Um, apologize because we're all just kind of complimenting each other in a circle now. Um, but one of the things that's really excellent about Romeo's teaching. I believe he learned when he worked as a demoer teaching board games for a board game distributor here in South Africa. He spent many, many hours teaching people how to play code names. Um, I know you play love code names, amongst others. And I think there's a lot of similarity um, between teaching someone how to play a board game and teaching someone in general. The ideas of how you present information and, and scaffolding information and connecting ideas and helping them um, draw those connections for themselves is something that Romeo does really well. And I think he learned that in part, I'm just guessing, um, from his uh, experience teaching people how to play board games. Over to you, Kieran. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, I agree with you entirely that the teaching someone how to play. I mean, last last night I taught you and Romeo how to play Station Fall, which you know, and, and and that kind of practice. But for me, my my teaching and stuff has been so influenced. And I know it's not a board game, and and we've been speaking about like tiles and Carcassonne and those sorts of things. But a pack of cards, and there's a South African version of Bridge, which is a little bit less complicated than the game bridge it's called tani it's played in durban it's 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 a kind of um it's in the indian community in durban where it's played religiously and and i for me that has taught me so much about teaching um and about how to work because the pack of cards you know my favorite class is when i come into the class and i hold up a, a normal deck of 52 playing cards and i say this is the greatest gaming console that was ever made like you can throw away your playstations you can throw away all of that this is a pack of cards and it's endless and it is just you know and, and from that from from a simple thing that can play a game like snap all the way to something as beautiful and complex as bridge and for me it's been such a useful teaching tool um because it's so versatile it's random but also you can mitigate randomness you can gamble you can play silly fast you know it's just such a such a nice tool for teaching um, and, and a way to introduce our students who, who don't know necessarily about board games, but they've played Crazy Eights, which is like Uno in the, in the schoolyard. And from there, I can teach them the next card game, then Bridge. And even from Bridge, there's so much kind of technical thinking that you can move into board games. So, so for me, it's a useful tool for exposure and, and thinking through um, as a pedagogical tool, yeah. Yeah, I think I think also, you know, demystifying what you're actually presenting people with as well. You know, hopefully most people have been exposed to uh, games, rather like chess, actually. You know, it's it's a, or Go, very universalised games played, played around the world in slightly different ways or not. But yeah, yeah, no. OK, we have five um, minutes. I am, just that, I'm reminded of the students that tried to, well, said he'd made a new game and we pointed out oh. it was just rummy. He refused to believe us. Yeah. We were like, no, no, here are the rules from the, like the bicycle website. Here are the rules to Rummy. Here, see how and he was like, well, I made it myself. Like, but it's not new. But yeah, I think I, mm. I think that's really interesting. Is where you find students who haven't got a pool of knowledge from one thing or aren't like we have students who've never really played card games. And one one year, I was like, everyone redesign card games, but you can't see the cards or something like something along those lines. They were like, I've not, I've never really played card games. It was like let's start um so that kind of thing i think is really interesting where you start to have those conversations of where knowledge overlaps and where people do know things and yeah definitely all the different tools that we kind of have and with the influences the students bring in as well as ours are really sort of key but yeah 
Cool. Okay, we have four minutes. Um, I'm not sure if we've got time to answer another question because we're taking about seven minutes on each question. So I think um, let's go round and see what what would you like to see or what would you what are you going to try to do um, teaching board games in the future? So and let's start with you, Kieran, because I'm just going to put you on the spot. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's no problem. Um, so uh, fortunately, I have a bit of time to think about that because I only take the second semester, which starts in, in, in August. Um, Kristen and Romeo are in the thick of it now. Um, but, you know, I, I, I'm quite I'm quite anxious and excited to get back to being in a classroom with the students um, and, and to kind of share the joy of it. Um, I think that as much as I said earlier that the reflective process has been really useful and really kind of um, pleasant for us as 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 teachers. I feel we've lost some of the fun. Um, we've lost some of the kind of joy of the playfulness from the online environment. So I'm really looking forward to how to bring those back. Um, last year, I set the students tasks to like figuring out how long my beard was just from an image that they'd have to write in their design journal. I mean, at that point, it was a lockdown beard, so it was much, much longer. Um, but just bringing back joy um, and and to to kind of highlight that. Uh, and this is again maybe a little bit embarrassing, but Romeo, in, when he was in first year, made a Street Fighter game, and in it, whenever a round started, he would be standing there and he'd go fight, and he'd make the sound. But there was such joy in 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 seeing the students really enjoying that. I mean, that was late in the year, so he figured out how play had worked, and and I just want to see that joy and, and playfulness, which I feel the online has a little bit removed from us. Um, but yeah, and I also asked Romeo if he could package himself in boxes and send himself if he published the game because it it didn't quite work as well without him saying that. So yeah, I'm just <laughs> looking to yeah, amazing. Okay, in which case, uh, since Romeo is dying of shame uh, and and uh, embarrassment, I, I feel like it, we feel like we're going around making everybody go slightly pink with uh, <laughs> excitement. Um, okay, so uh, Kirsten. Karen stole my answer, um, so I'll adjust mine slightly. Um, I think, and I'm thinking now about my curriculum, about the last few weeks that we have of the semester, and as we move into exams, um, the also as Karen was saying, um, reintroducing some of some of the joy and the playfulness. Um, I I really miss that. I miss our lab with a hundred students uh, giving me a headache because everyone's screaming because they're so excited, rolling their dice, playtesting their games, um, all of those kinds of things. But I, I'm, I've got another panel later on, but I really want to sit and look at my curriculum and see how we can introduce some more of that um, or, or, or remove some of that fear of failure. Um, in a in a more active way, um, I'm open to suggestions. If anyone has any, I'm thinking about it all the time. Um, but that's definitely something that I'm thinking about moving forward. Is how do we how do we make students feel safe? And obviously, there are like financial repercussions and stuff of actually failing. Um, but how do we how do we make them feel safe to fail and to try again? Um, that's the thing I'll be thinking about. Fab, I'm assuming we're not going to have an immediate cutoff, but it will be pretty soon. So Romeo and then Nia very quickly. Sorry. <laughs> Romeo, That's go fine. for it. Um, Kirsten took my answer. Um, <laughs> uh, mine was very much the... <laughs> Pardon? You're all teaching in sync. It's great. <laughs> Share one brain cell. No, I'm <laughs> Suppose mine would be very much in the same vein, um, removing that fear of failure. I've seen um, a lot, I think more now um, since, since, since the pandemic, um, that there's this push to, I must get this right. And I'm doing this so that I am right or so that I get marks. When actually going back to my first year and even up to my third year, in fact, it was very much a, I'm gonna try it, balls to the wall. If it works, it doesn't. If it doesn't, well, well, we'll try again. 
And that's the kind of experimental energy that I feel, as Kieran has brought up, that, that we're missing in, you know, in being so separate and something we'd like to bring back. That play that I can just try things and see what comes out of that. And yeah, I, I like to say that to my students a lot, just go balls to the wall, just go ham, go crazy, just throw things and see what sticks. And that's what I'm really looking forward to more than anything, just for the craziness. Yeah, yeah I think we're similar. Right, but, yeah. I know we've kind of talked about this because we teach together, but I think that it's really interesting to hear that same thing. I've missed the chance to play and to have playfulness come into classes. And we did a lot of stuff online, but none of it felt as playful and silly. And the stuff we did with our first years, where we talked about sort of everyday gameplay and things, that was a lot silly. And we did some silly things with that. But the second years, it all felt a bit sensible and serious. Um, so, yeah, I think definitely along those same lines, how, how can we bring a little bit of whimsy and frivolity back into the classes? Although we'll probably have to find a way to grade it. But, yeah, just actually how can we bring that in? How can we get, how can we get the students to be thinking about en enjoying things again? And it's going to have to be a really gentle, like, ramp up yeah. to that as well because I'm not really, like, we'll have second years that have never been on campus before. We've got a lot of orientation and induction to do as well so I think our module is going to form part of that too so I'm kind of looking at how we can start to get them to form friendships and bring build bring people together and all of that as well so yeah I think it's it's going to be a module that again is quite a lot and mm. but yeah some of the stuff with the games and probably two player games are probably going to keep because that's worked really well so four player but yeah yeah yeah, and we've seen our students form incredibly close units as a result of working together. So I think that's going to be a really strong thing. OK, right. We have definitely run out of time. But um, for those of you watching, I hope that was I hope that was a really good introduction um, to the next rest of the next two days, because I was I really enjoyed that. So um, and I hope you all did as well. So um, if we could all uh, press our, our uh, hand buttons to, to applaud. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Patrick.